Okay, good morning, everybody. I hope you're all well. We've been having some uh, fun and games this morning. Clearly, the uh, the webinar um, hasn't woke up this morning for uh, for one reason or another. But uh, we think uh, we're we're live now. So uh, good morning to you all. Uh, we're delighted that um, uh, we've got uh, Rachel McGuinness from Wake Up uh, with Zest with us this morning. And, good morning. Uh, <laughs> hi, Rachel. Rachel was uh, over in Orlando, so she's feeling a bit uh, uh, jet lagged at the moment. But um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we've got some um, hints and tips for you guys with regards to obviously uh, uh, sleep. Um, I think due to the technical challenges, we uh, we don't have uh, uh, Ria Ingleby, who hopefully will join us in a moment, along with uh, with Andrea Martin. But um, I'm Gavin Spence. I'm head of uh, membership at the Thames Valley Chamber, and uh, hopefully, as I say in a moment, we'll have Ria. Ingleby, founder of the Well Plus Group, join us and, uh, and Andrea Martin. But as I say, we are delighted to have uh, the Chief Vitality Officer, Rachel McGuinness from, uh, from Wake Up uh, with Zest. So good morning. Rachel, do you want to just give us a quick overview of your, uh, your expertise and um, just introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. So um, yeah, my company is called Wake Up With Zest and I work with what I call forward thinking companies who understand um, giving their employees the, um, the, the benefits of having well-being programs. And I work to four philosophies, which I call my four pillars of vitality, which are sleep well, eat smart, move more and chill out. And um, really, if, if uh, em employees are engaged in well-being programs they're going to be happier they're going to be healthier they're going to be more motivated which means they'll be more engaged at work more productive which means happier customers at the end of the day um, and, and well. it is and I've been in the, uh, the health business or health industry for about 14 years now and I used to be uh, very unfit overweight uh, very stressed Drank a lot, smoked a lot. Uh, so, <laughs> so like a bit of a rebel. Yeah, I was. Um, <laughs> 18 years ago, I was working in the telecoms industry as a, an event and marketing manager. And I was traveling all around Europe and I had a very, very unhealthy lifestyle. And what really happened was I had a bit of an epiphany moment in Barcelona in the year 2000 and decided that at the age of 37, I really needed to get fit and healthy. And that's what I did. So I stopped. Uh, dieting and started eating healthily. I started to do a bit of exercise and it was amazing the results I was getting. I, was, I began to sleep better, uh, my skin was a lot better, I had loads more energy and uh, as I began to lose weight because I was eating healthier um, I could see my shape changing. I also gave up cigarettes, uh, stopped smoking and cut down on my drinking as well. Fantastic, well uh, good, good for you. Um, I mean, the, the webinars we've been running throughout the, uh, the course of the year have all focused on obviously health and well-being and um, we're very much behind the ethos of healthy employees, our uh, productive employees and um, um, this uh, webinar today is obviously focused on sleep and the importance of sleep and it's something that we all do and um, it's um, obviously something that plays a, a major factor in, in the body, rejuvenating itself and the brain and building connections and um, obviously embedding memory. So I'm really excited about today's session and um, I've already got a few uh, few questions, but um, we'll jump straight into uh, your, uh, your first slide here, uh, Rachel. And um, obviously getting down to the basics, you know, let's talk about why do we actually uh, need to sleep in the first place? Well, um, you know, I talked about the four pillars of vitality uh, just now, and I feel that sleep is fundamental to your health. It is the number one thing. And I've gone through periods that during my corporate days where I suffered from insomnia and it, it nearly led me to burnout. And then about five years ago, I had a couple of years of insomnia due to various reasons, a lot of stress in my life at the time. And I, I was really desperate to get back into a sleep routine. And that's really kind of what made me put sleep at the forefront of my four pillars of vitality. And I just started reading, instead of going to the doctor and going for sleeping tablets, I, I started reading loads of books about sleep and research. And, um, and I managed to cure my own insomnia. And I just learned so much information about sleep. So Really, the reason why we, we sleep is that your body is performing critical functions. And most of these are happening during deep sleep. So, uh, Gavin, you mentioned 
you know, it's, it's about uh, consolidating your memory. So mm. we are exposed to um, about, I think it's about 70,000 bits of information a day. So our brains, even though they are quite big, um, I can't remember, I was reading recently, I think it's something like, uh, oh, I can't, no, I can't remember the figure now, but um, our brains are, are pretty big on memory, you know, much bigger than, than computers are. However, your brain can't cope with having every piece of experience that it has during the day to be put into long-term memory. So your brain at, at night is consolidating that information and deciding what it's going to, to discard and what it's going to take from short-term memory into long-term memory. Um, <clears throat> And also deep sleep is the only time that your brain can actually cleanse itself. So it has its own detoxing mechanism. And um, it's, it's uh, so in the body, we have something called the lymphatic system where we sweat and we excrete waste through other parts of our body. And, but the brain has its own uh, detox system called the glymphatic system. And what happens during deep sleep is, um, our brain cells shrink down because what's happened is during the day we've had a buildup of a sticky plaque or protein called um, amyloid beta. And um, what happens is spinal or, or a, a fluid comes up through the spine and as the brain cells shrink down, it almost like shampoos in between all the brain cells to flush out this buildup of this um, sticky plaque. Uh, if you don't sleep well, you'll probably feel that you feel a bit, a bit of a foggy head in the mornings. You can't think straight. So this is due to this, this protein not being flushed away or this sticky plaque. If it's allowed to build up over, over a number of years, it can increase your risk of um, dementia and Alzheimer's. Um, something else that's also happening is that free radicals in your in your um, body are being cl uh, cleaned up so free radicals are what i call the nasty cells these are cells that can potentially cause cancer and then of course uh, your cells your muscles and your tissues are being renewed and repaired it's when the growth hormone is secreted and then uh, certain processes and systems in your body are being regulated like your appetite your metabolism uh, your blood pressure and your hormones. Uh, so if we don't get enough sleep, we really are increasing our risk of uh, serious illness and disease. So the, the number one thing is that uh, sleep deprivation is a precursor to um, depression. Mm. Uh, it will also uh, increase your risk of um, high blood pressure, stroke, heart failure, heart disease. Uh, and this is actually caused by the lack of melatonin in the body, which I'm going to be sort of talking about a little bit in a minute. Um, also uh, increase in type 2 diabetes. Um, and this is because your appetite isn't being regulated. So there is an increase in your hormone called ghrelin, which uh, controls your appetite. So if you don't sleep enough, you're going to feel hungrier. So there's no control over your appetite. So this is where you're going to start craving sugary carb based foods. And um, then there's a decrease in another um, hormone called leptin. And leptin um, basically is um, controlling sort of what's going into the fat stores. So if you're eating a whole load of carb, um, then your body's going, I don't know what to do with it. So it's going to put it in the, in the, in the fat stores. Uh, and then there is also an increase in cancer because of free radicals not being cleaned up and then an increase uh, in the risk of Alzheimer's and dementia. So all those things were enough to scare me to make sure I got my sleep back on track when I went through my last yeah. one. It's quite a scary yeah. list. And uh, obviously by not getting enough sleep, you know, that opens up a, uh, opens up the, the, the avenue for a whole load of potential other problems. So exactly what is the optimal is the, you know, what you hear these different numbers being bounded around of, 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 you know, how much sleep you need, but I guess everybody's different and you hear, you know, some people, um, some major leaders out there who, who kind of get off on uh, only three or four hours sleep, but you know, yeah. what, how much do we need? Right. Well, those leaders you'll probably find will 
have dementia or Alzheimer's when they're in their 70s. So Margaret Thatcher, who was always going on about having only four hours sleep, look what happened to her. Yeah. Uh, you know, and people like Elon Musk, you know, boasting about the lack of sleep because, you know, they, they just work so hard to create, you know, the latest car, the Tesla or the space program. And it's just completely ridiculous. And there has been a bit of a backlash from people like Ariana Huffington from um, ex Huffington Post now Thrive saying, you know, this is totally ridiculous. You should not boast about um, not having enough sleep to, to, you know, to get you further on in your career. So optimal sleep, it, they say between seven to nine hours, it's age dependent, this is for adults. Uh, so it's age dependent, but it's really how you feel when you wake up in the morning. It depends whether or not you are your chronotype, so whether or not you are a lark or an owl or somewhere in between. So for me, um, I'm quite happy on about six and a half hours. Mm. Um, but I'm mid 50s, so as you get older, you produce mes less melatonin, which means you may sleep less. But uh, I, I tend to listen to my body. On average, I'll get six and a half hours if my body needs more. So I'll sort of catch up a bit at weekends, then that, that's fine. But it's all about how you feel when you wake up in the morning. So when you wake up, do you feel well, do you wake up with zest? <laughs> it's really where my yes. company name came from. Yeah. But, you know, if you feel sort of energized, you're not feeling tired, you don't feel as though you need to go back to sleep again, um, or are you waking up with your alarm or are you waking up just before your alarm? So I always tend to wake up just before the alarm. And also it's a seasonal thing as well, because with more light, uh, you'll probably wake up earlier in the morning and you'll feel less tired um, in the evenings because of the light and really that's how we used to sleep back in the old times before electricity um or you know looking back to thousands of years that our ancestors we were dictated by the sun and the moon so that's mm. really how we slept so um humans aren't really designed for modern living in terms of sleep oh it's uh, it's fascinating um so Rachel, tell us about, um, I mean, well, I've got a question actually. Um, you know, I seem to wake up, I sleep very well. I always kind of nod off, uh, you know, um, when I need to go to sleep, I get in bed and I'm asleep within a couple of minutes, but I always seem to just wake up at five o'clock in the morning, regardless of where I am. And, you know, before the alarm goes off and I'm bright awake, you know, wide awake. And part of me is wanting to go back to sleep, but my body's just there and it's saying, right, let's get up, let's go. What, you know, what, what's that all about? Um, that, that could just be your natural body clock. Um, some people work, will wake up maybe say two, three or four o'clock in the morning um, because a, a, a adrenaline starts to get sort of secreted and that's when the sort of, that's the stress, uh, one of the stress hormones, cortisol and adrenaline. But then, um, so that could be a reason. Uh, so therefore you need to sort of maybe look at your stress levels or sort of looking at, um, you know, having a better bedtime routine before you go to sleep, or it could be just your natural wake up time. So it, you know, it depends what time you go to bed, how many hours of sleep you're getting. Um, but it, you know, it, it could be just natural wake up time, or it could be a little bit of sort of stress coming through that your, your brain is automatically just waking up um, and going, okay, right. What have I got to do? Yeah. Yeah. It's, we it's did it the day and or the day and night yes it's it's quite bizarre i uh, woke up with a song in my head that i just couldn't get rid of uh, this morning which was quite, <laughs> <laughs> quite uh, irritating um now i mean we've got um a, a, a quite a few uh, attendees on this uh, webinar by the way if you've got any questions that you want to uh, to put to rachel feel free to use the chat box and, uh, and obviously we can uh, we can answer those as we uh, as we uh, move along Mm. So I just want, wanted to actually just um, on the other slide men, uh, mention about the cost to um, our economy in the UK on sleep, which is £40 billion per annum with over 200,000 sick days lost. Wow. Um, you know, which is a lot of money um, because about 70% of the population are sleep deprived. 70% uh, are getting less than six hours sleep a night and 40% of those are getting less than five hours a night. Uh, and these are stats from the um, British uh, Sleep Council. And, and the UK is actually the second most sleep deprived nation in the world after the United States. 
Wow, that's a, that's a fascinating stat. So what can an organisation do then to help employees sleep better? I mean, we hear of the, obviously, you know, some companies uh, allow power napping, other companies, yeah. you know, it's, uh, it's, it's quite frowned upon. But um, um, I, I, I used to work with a guy who religiously at one o'clock uh, every day would just uh, have, a, have a nap at his desk. And, uh, yeah. you know, he, he, <laughs> that, that was no issue at all for him. And, um, you know, it, it yeah, it, I think it's different in every company. So what can an organisation do to help? Well, educate their um, employees on the importance of sleep. Um, so really, this, um, this is kind of what we're doing with, with the, the attendees on this webinar is sort of giving you a little taster of, you know, understanding why we sleep and what actually sort of happens um, when we're sleeping. Um, because I think when you understand how sleep works, it makes it easier to improve it and to really stress the importance of getting a good night's sleep. And um, maybe, you know, what we're doing in our modern living isn't conducive to, a, you know, a great night's um, kit. Um, and, and also making sure that, I mean, a lot of, I know a lot of international companies, if they're working with different time zones, people have got to stay up to talk to Australia or, or the west side of America. And, it, and it's kind of making allowances for those employees who have to do that. Uh, also employees who are traveling long haul, um, how they cope with jet lag, which we'll, we'll talk about later. Um, and you know, what, what time they put the, their employees on flights and whether they're allowed to travel um, business class or premium economy. So there's all sorts of different things that sort of go into the mix with the different types of companies that I'm working with. But um, I think it is, helping people understand that sleep is fundamental to our health. And I really think that our public sort of uh, health service messages from, um, so the NHS or um, the Department of um, or Public Health England, they're not putting enough emphasis on the importance of sleep. Of importance of sleep. Hmm, fascinating. Well, we've got a uh, question. Uh, thank you, Justin. Justin Robbins. Um, so he's saying uh, keeping track of sleep patterns is much easier these days through technology such as a Fitbit. Yes. Do you think organisations should provide their employees with Fitbits and then link them to their uh, employee well-being metrics? Obviously, it should um, be a company house. That's a great question. Yeah, I, I kind of sit on the fence with this one um, because... Um, I, I love my Fitbit and I, I always check my sleep every day, <laughs> partly because I'm, I'm just absolutely fascinated with it. Sometimes they are not the most accurate of things. Um, so the later Fitbits are a lot, um, or the newer Fitbits are a lot more accurate than say the older ones. Uh, it can lead to a bit of frustration with people because they go, I thought I had a really great night's sleep and it's saying that I only slept for two hours or it hasn't recorded it properly. So what happens within a, a Fitbit is, um, it's got a little, it's the, the tech that it's got, it's got something called an accelerometer in it, and it um, records the, the movement of your arm in the sleep. So actually, if you, it, actually, if you flick up the next uh, slide, Gavin, yeah. um, I'll be able to kind of tie this in with, um, with sort of talking about what's on that slide. Um, but I'll also go on to talking about what organisations should be. So it's got an accelerometer in it. So that's recording the movement of your arm during your sleep. Uh, it also records your heart rate as well. So it will know when you've gone into deep sleep, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, but I know um, some companies like British Airways are working with uh, their healthcare provider for their employees. Uh, so they've, they've got their Fitbits or their, their you know, whatever um, activity tracker sort of linked into their system. And obviously there are rewards for that, but it could be very stressful for somebody who's going through, you know, maybe a period of insomnia for whatever reason, whether it's health reasons or external reasons, you know, stressful time in their life and they're not sleeping properly. Would they be penalized by their organization for not sleeping properly? Or is it where the company steps in and gives them some help? So I suppose it, it starts to be that thing where is it a little bit too intrusive? So, um, but it's yeah. a really good question. So I think it really depends on the organisation. It depends on the buy-in from employees. Um, because obviously Vitality Health have really kind of locked in this whole thing that um, if you have their health insurance, then you'll get an Apple Watch and um you get it free um if um, reduced your premiums the more exercise you're doing 
um, and looking after your uh, weight. Um, I'm not quite sure how much, how deep they go into sort of monitoring your health, but um, yeah, it, it could be a good thing, but it's also a bad thing. It's a little bit like people who want to lose weight, but don't want to step on the scales. Mm. <laughs> It's a bit big brotherish, isn't it? I mean, it takes it to another level. But I could, I could see certainly in some um, roles. Let's say you're a um, a driver um, who who travels long distances, and obviously, yes. you know, there's tachographs and things like that within yes. the vehicle. But you know, that's all fair and well having the tachograph. But at the same time, if the driver hasn't had uh, the right amount of sleep, then he could be, uh, you know, really well. It could just be a risk to all the other road users. So. Well, Exactly, yes. And, um, you know, if you're not getting enough sleep, um, it's like the equivalent of being drunk. Mm. And being behind the, the wheel of a car, um, I think it's, I can't remember what the stat is now, I think it's about, um, oh, I think it's about 65% of road traffic accidents are caused by fatigue drivers. Wow. And that number goes up even more uh, when we change the clocks in spring, um, when we take an hour off, it, 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 it kind of disorientates us for you know a few days and for some people it can be a few weeks because it's that change in time that um because you've lost an hour really confuses your body clock um but um yeah so i sit on the fence with it but it would have its uses um with, with um employees but actually i think that, that this leads into me explaining a little bit more about how our, our sleep works so um We've got a master clock in our brain called the suprachiasmatic nucleus or the SCN. And it sits just underneath the hypothalamus gland behind the optic nerves. So our eyes are not just for seeing, but they're also letting light into um, this part of the brain. And the SCN is monitoring light levels. So as soon as it starts to get dusk, you may feel you, you may start to feel tired. So this is where I was talking earlier about your, you're gonna have different sort of energy levels in the winter as opposed to the summer. So we've, we've recently put our clocks back. It's getting darker earlier. So therefore we're feeling a little bit more tired and fatigued. So as soon as it starts to get dark, the SCN then signals um, the pineal gland which is about the size of, the gra of a grain of rice to stop uh, producing the hormone melatonin. So we all know about melatonin as being something great to take for jet lag as a tablet, but it's actually a hormone. Um, and that's why it's not really um, freely available in this country. Um, you could, probably can get it on prescription, but in places like the States, you can just buy it over the counter. Um, but my whole thing is you don't want to put hormones into your body unless you know really what they're doing. Mm. So, so um, melatonin is your sleepy hormone which drives um, the need for sleep so it's like a drowsy hormone and it only comes out when it's dark um, so they call it the vampire hormone or the Dracula hormone <laughs> um, and then so what's then happening is that um, when you start to go to sleep um, lots of things as we discussed before are happening in your body and every cell in your body has a little miniature clock which is dictated by the master clock. Uh, so this is where, you know, the importance of good sleep is to have enough deep sleep um, so that all these critical functions can happen in your body to keep you healthy and basically sort of keep you alive. Uh, so you'll see the little image on the on this slide, um, which is basically taken from Fitbit, um, showing how your sleep works. So if you've got a Fitbit or an activity tracker, you may be familiar with this little graph. So I'm going to explain more about how your sleep works. So we've got four different stages of sleep. So we've got very light sleep, um, light sleep, deep sleep, and REM sleep, which is rapid eye movement sleep or your dream state sleep. And uh, so what happens is when your head hits the pillow, uh, you, you, have, you go into very light sleep, which is where you can be sort of woken up. And so it's the, sort of that, in that sort of half and half state. And then you'll go into um, very light sleep. So if you see on the graph, it goes from red, um, it'll kind of go into light, uh, so that sort of mid blue, and then it goes into uh, dark blue. So that's your deep sleep. 
and then it'll come back into light sleep and then you'll go into REM sleep, which is the uh, rapid eye movement sleep. So what is happening as you're drifting off into the different stages of sleep, going into deep sleep, your brain waves are slowing down, your breathing is slowing, your heart rate is slowing, your muscles are beginning um, uh, to get more relaxed and your blood pressure is, is dropping. Uh, so when you are in deep sleep, this is when you are at your most relaxed. And this is to basically save energy so that your body can do all those critical functions. Um, and when you go into uh, REM sleep, it's like, it's like you're almost awake. So your brain waves are very active. So this is where we're dreaming. Uh, your eyes are moving. Uh, so there's sort of this rapid eye movement. Um, your breathing, your heart rate and your blood pressure are almost normal, but your muscles are paralyzed during dream, uh, dream state sleep. Wow. And scientists seem to think that this is to actually stop us from acting out our dreams. So if you have crazy dreams, <laughs> it's probably good that you're paralyzed. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, I, I dreamt I was in an action movie the other night and I was like jumping off like 70 foot walls. So that would be really good if, if I was awake um, or my muscles were paralyzed. So anyway, um, so sometimes there can be a lag with people when they wake up and they'll wake up and they can't move. This is only a temporary thing, but it, it's just that there's been a bit of a lag between brain signaling muscles to, to start to move. Um, we're sleeping in 90 minute cycles, more or less. It's on average, it can go up to 125 minutes. Um, so you're cycling through these different levels of sleep ev um, every night. Um, so if you do six um, hours sleep, you're gonna be doing four cycles. So I think my cycles, cause I sleep about six and a half hours, they're, they're just slightly longer than 90 minutes. Um, the first two cycles of sleep, you're going to get more deep sleep. So you can see this in, in the graph on the slide. And then it will taper off to more REM sleep. And you'll see there's just been a little dip in deep sleep towards the end of the, the night's sleep. So that's really how your sleep is, is working. Um, we did talk about how sleep, uh, humans are hardwired to sleep between seven to nine hours, but that is an average. Um, and we actually spend a third of our life asleep. So if you live to be 90, you'll actually spend 30 years asleep. That's just an incredible stat. But as we understand now, it's not a complete waste of time. No, clearly not. <laughs> no. <laughs> it's a scary thought though, to think that we're, uh, we, yeah, we could be spending 30 years asleep. I know, I know, I know. And, uh, you know, so it, it is a very valuable asset and there's nothing, you know, uh, I think it was Edison, um, who invented the light bulb and he said that sleep was a complete waste of time left over by our ancestors but Edison was in fact an insomniac so he used to you know he was trying and trying and trying to invent the light bulb and he used to sleep with ball bearings in his hand and put his, ha his head on his bench and as soon as he dropped off to sleep his hand relaxed he dropped the ball bearings on the floor to wake him up oh wow yeah so <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty extreme. Shall I uh, move us to the uh, to the next slide? Yeah, sure. Fantastic. Okay. And again, for you guys out there, if you've got any questions, feel free to use the chat uh, window there, and um, and and um, yeah, uh, jump jump in. So um, we've got some top tips here. Um, mm. I, I, I know a colleague in my team swears by uh, blackout blinds, and yes. uh, as does my wife. And even if even if there's a light shining, like a small LED light from uh, from the TV, she has to get some tape and, uh, and cover it up. But uh, I guess that comes back to what you were talking about uh, in, a moment ago. But um, do, do take a moment, Rachel, to share the, uh, the top tips. Yeah, sure. And, um, and uh, also after this, I'll uh, talk about um, sleep and travel as well. So your bedroom needs to be conducive to a great night's sleep. So it needs to be dark. Um, it needs to be cool and uh, so optimum temperatures are 16 to 18 degrees celsius uh, well ventilated so make sure you've, uh, you've, you've got a window open um, or even you know just a crack or in the summer have uh, a decent fan i, I swear, swear by dyson fans i'm not i'm not endorsed by them at all but i've got one and they're really really good uh, and also 
the environment needs to be relaxing as well. So, um, you know, if it's untidy or a mess and you're always feeling a bit stressed about it, you know, make sure you give it a good tidy up uh, and just make it a place that's a haven for, um, for sleep. Uh, it should be device free. So no laptops, phones, tablets in the bedroom at all, or TVs. Um, number one, they emit electromagnetic pollution, which will disturb your night's sleep. So these aren't things that our ancestors used to have. Uh, but also um, having a TV in your bedroom, just it, it, it's, it's, it's not good. Uh, I know a, lot, know a lot of people go, well, you know, I like to watch Netflix on my laptop in bed. It's like, just don't do it. Your bedroom is for two things, sleep and love. Um, so your brain just understands that that is what the bedroom is for and that's what it should be for. Um, if you're, uh, so going on to giving your bed an, an MOT, um, you know, do you need to change a mattress? Are you beginning to, you know, if you're sleeping with a partner, um, if, if you roll over, do they move as well? Or if you feel them move, then, and, it, and it's waking you up, then, you know, that's not good. Or if you're waking up feeling achy. So really a mattress, the life of a mattress is probably eight to 10 years. Um, and you don't have to buy the most expensive mattresses. It's, it's uh, just finding one that suits your sleeping position. Uh, there's lo loads of people online now or manufacturers online selling mattresses at reasonable prices. And you can have them for a hundred days and if you don't like it, you can get your money back and, and send it back. But what I do recommend is that you go somewhere and try out a mattress and try out for about 10 or 15 minutes in your normal sleeping position to make sure mm -hmm. that um, it, it's comfortable for you. And mm -hmm. it's the same for pillows. So, you know, this is whether or not you're a back, a front or a side sleeper or you're a mixture of all three. Um, pillows are exactly the same. Um, I don't like feather pillows. I find them um, too squishy. So I prefer a firmer pillow. Uh, so I like, um, I've gone through using memory pillow, memory foam pillows, but I actually like a foam pillow now. Uh, so that's kind of suits me and I sleep better on that. Mm. Um, and then also, you know, make sure your bed linen is, is nice and comfortable. I mean, I like Egyptian cotton, I tend to, I invested in some high thread count Egyptian cotton and I love it. And that's kind of my sort of luxurious bed linen and I enjoy getting into bed and, you know, snuggle down and it's, and it's nice. Also make sure that your duvet is the right um, weight for the time of year. So in the summer, I loved a two tog. Um, in the winter, I can go up to a 10 tog. So, uh, so it's all about making sure that you're comfortable, um, your temperature control is moderated enough. Uh, actually, just talking about body temperature control, um, uh, it's kind of a new thing that I've discovered in the past few years is the wool duvets. So um, it sounds kind of a bit weird, but they're almost like a sort of blanket within a duvet, but um, they're great. Uh, they're a great natural fiber. Wool is great natural fiber for moderating your body temperature. So um, I can really recommend wool duvets and their pillows as well. Uh, your brain loves a routine. Um, so it likes to go to bed more or less at the same time every night and then wake up more or less at the same time every morning. So Gavin, your five o'clock thing is, <laughs> is your brain. Right. Um, your brain is just, just doing that. Um, but obviously, as I said before, with the seasons, it's going to uh, change slightly. Uh, another thing I wanted to mention is uh, if you're a night owl and you have difficulty waking up in the morning, you're, you probably don't want to have blackout blinds because you, you want to wake up with natural light. Um, so there are several things that you can do for this. So um, have very thin, thin or have thinner curtains um, or have a sunrise alarm clock. There's a company called Lumi, L-U-M-I-E, who make... Um, these sunrise alarm clocks. And what it will do is wake you up with light in your bedroom over a 30 minute period. And they're also great for people who suffer from seasonal adjustment disorder. Um, also, night owls should avoid as much light as they can in the evening to help them produce enough melatonin to drive that need for sleep. So which goes on to avoiding blue light, which should be for everybody. Okay. Um, the blue light problem really has only been 
a problem for the last 10, 11 years since the uh, advent of the iPhone, uh, where we're looking at uh, screens quite closely and screens have obviously become a lot brighter. Uh, so we've got the we've got Android and well any smartphone. We've got tablets. We've got uh, laptops, all shining light into our eyes at a, quite a close proximity to our face. So if your brain is trying to secrete melatonin because it's getting dusk outside, we've got bright lights on in our house. We're looking at all these devices. It means there's going to be a delay in the secretion of melatonin, which means that it could be like another 90 minutes before it gets um, produced. So this is where we really need to listen to our bodies and shut our tech off at least an hour before our natural bedtime. Fantastic. Um, okay. Even though you can get um, filters for phones, uh, you know, you've got night shift for iPhones and then you've got um, flux or flux for laptops. Um, sometimes it's not just looking at the blue light it's the stimulation that we're getting all the stress or the excitement that we're getting from sort of looking at our screens so for example if you're looking at work stuff that could be stressful if you're looking at emails and stuff before bedtime if you've got international offices on the other side of the of the world um or if you're looking at social media that's like an adventure playground for the brain um so it's it's try and have a, an embargo for at least an hour before bedtime so your brain has a chance to relax and do its natural thing. So that's avoiding blue light. Um, alcohol and caffeine can screw up your sleep. Um, they, they mess up your deep sleep. And also I thought to say um, about your choice of alcohol. I find um, as I've got into my 50s that wine really dehydrates me and I have a worse night's sleep if I have wine than if I have a couple of gins. <laughs> so, <laughs> Interesting, yeah. yeah. I'm sure there's many of our listeners who can, uh, who can agree with that. <laughs> yeah. So um, yeah, choose your alcohol carefully. Uh, and also, um, you know, both have a bit of a half-life in your, in your body. So caffeine has a six-hour kind of half-life. So if you've drunk something, say, at three o'clock in the afternoon, it's still going to be in your body at uh, your caffeine. It's still going to be in your body at nine o'clock in the evening. Um, one of the things that I found that if I, I'm very sensitive to caffeine now, if I have a cup too late, I'll wake up with palpitations in the middle of the night and, and, and sweats. So it has a massive effect on my body. Also, both are diuretics, which means that maybe the more alcohol and caffeine you're drinking um, means that you may be getting up to go to the loo in the middle of the night. Mm. Well, I'm um, just going to, um, we've got a couple of questions yeah, that sure. come in here. So um, I'm just going to uh, interrupt and maybe we can just run through these. But I'm glad you covered off the, uh, the point which uh, that, that second bullet, type, bullet point about the, uh, the bed MOT and replacing mm. the mattress because uh, you sometimes see uh, marketing out there encouraging people to change their mattress every you know six to eight years. And I was kind of thinking, is that true? Is that a real stat or is it just us trying to be, uh, you know, is it a clever marketing ploy? Yes, yeah, marketing. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, well, it's it, nice to hear that. But, but uh, if you I, have an uncomfortable mattress, you need to change it. <laughs> absolutely, yeah. Well, I went with the John Lewis one and, um, you know, uh, I've never had a better sleep uh, since. And, uh, mm. you know, considering we spend so much time, when you say, you know, yeah. 30 years, you know, when you spend so much time, you know, in bed, it's mm. well worth making that investment. Absolutely. Um, so I've got a question here from Harriet, and this is a good one because um, um, it, it relates to earplugs. Do you recommend a certain brand of earplug? Oh, yes. I've tried so many. Yes. Oh, Harriet. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I, I tried loads, and um, I used to just go to Boat Boots and buy the, the foam ones, and I never kind of really got on with them. And then I was sent um, a, a freebie pair from, it was a sleep course I did, and there were these bright yellow and pink ones. And I thought, what are these? Anyway, I tried them and they really, really worked. So these are, um, are from Amazon. I can't remember what um, they're called now. Is it laser light? Or am I thinking? I, I don't know. They, yeah, they, but if, you, if you put on Amazon to search um, earplugs and you'll see these bright um, yellow and pink um, ones come up they, they almost look like sweets like rhubarb and custard sweets they are the best things and whenever I do talks I, I hand them out at talks and um, 
as Gavin mentioned, um, I was out in Orlando and I flew back. I got in Saturday morning. And um, in the little pack on the airline, um, they gave me earplugs, but they were like really, really hard. And, you know, I just thought I'd just try them. I thought they had absolutely no benefit at all. I used my own earplugs and was able to kind of like push them in. And um, it, it just cut out a load of noise in the cabin. And it just meant I was able to get you know, the best sleep I could on a plane. But they are really, really good. Um, so I live above a bar um, and on a main street. And I have a partner who snores very loudly. And <laughs> I, I sleep really well because um, I, I, don't, I don't hear any noise. And actually, he uses them because he says I snore too. <laughs> <laughs> Are these the pink and yellow ones? I've just bought Amazon. Yes. Yes. Oh, right. Yes. Yeah. That, so I can see uh, they're called. If they are the ones, uh, laser light. Uh, it is powered, laser light. Yeah, powered uh, 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 light laser, light foam earplugs. They're only two ninety nine. So uh, it's a well. Yeah. Look, I tell you what. Buy them in bulk. So um, I mean, you don't have to buy the amount that I buy because I buy hundreds of the damn things. So I buy about three hundred for twenty quid. So. Don't buy just one pair, buy, you know, 20 pairs and they'll last you a while, you know, depending on how long, often you want to change them. Um, uh, but they, they are just like the best things and they're much cheaper than any of the earplugs that you can buy in any of the high street chemists. Fantastic. Excellent. OK. And then um, I've got a, a, another question here. Um, someone listening uh, uh, anonymously, interestingly, which is fine. Uh, do you have any view on the sleep uh, on sleep apps, especially the one like uh, Sleepio? Sleepio is great, uh, and the the guy who uh, actually created Sleepio trained me um, for my cognitive behaviour therapy in sleep. Um, guy called Colin Espy. So, uh, cognitive behaviour therapy for insomnia is brilliant, and that's kind of like a a module that you can do yourself. But I think they do have people, uh, sort of doctors, that will um, you can pay for like an upgraded service. So, so that is good. Um, so, I do recommend that one. Yeah. So okay. if you do have sleeping problems, um, CBTI or cognitive behaviour therapy for insomnia is, is the best thing. OK, fantastic. Well, uh, the question's coming in thick and fast now. So um, this is a really good one because this kind of talk, this links to the uh, to the technology that we were just uh, just covering off. And mm. um, I'm sure a lot of people are affected by uh, by this. So uh, the question is, I like to read before going to sleep and use a Kindle. Is this a good or a bad thing? A Kindle is fine as long as you have the screen turned right down. Don't use an iPad, um, well, unless the screen is turned right down as well. Um, uh, but I suppose for a Kindle, a Kindle can be just used as, it's just used for reading. If you've got an iPad, it's quite easy to get distracted into other things. <laughs> but if you do use an iPad, then make sure the screen is turned right down. Uh, so is a Kindle broadcasting the blue light then? Um, they can do if it, if it's um, if it's like the on the bright setting. I'm not quite sure how much light they give off because um, light is measured in lux, and I, I, I haven't tested the Kindle. But you can buy um, these. Um, oh, what do they call them? Uh, jet lag brain has kicked in. Um, they're, they're like um, glasses which filter blue light, blue, blue light filter glasses. Uh, you can get, again, you can get them off Amazon, they're about 10, 12 quid. And you can wear those, um, say if you're watching telly in the evening, just to stop the amount of blue light going into your eyes, if sleep is a problem. If sleep isn't a problem and you wake up feeling great, then fine, you don't have to do it. But, um, you know, it could be just another way to just stop blue light going into your eyes. Okay, but, fantastic. Yeah. Okay, and then um, the uh, the last question we've got in the uh, in the bank here. This is from Sarah Paris. Where do you stand on uh, reading uh, a book before going to bed, and is it better than uh, watching TV? Yes, a book is much better. I guess because you're being stimulated by uh, what's on the TV, and um, yeah. it's uh, yeah. Well, what, what, why 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 is a book better in your view? Um, well, I suppose. People, uh, there is an increasing amount of people having sleep problems, and this is due to, you know, maybe the type of TV that we've got on television at the moment, you know, all these sort of like quite violent dramas and thrillers and things like that. And they, they can potentially, um, you know, start to disrupt your sleep, but it's all about relaxing before bedtime. So reading a book is great. Right, okay. Uh, Sarah's just jumped in to say she reads thrillers, so <laughs> there's a combination <laughs> of the two there. 
Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, if, if it does not set your sleep, then that's absolutely fine. The but problem I have reading before I go to bed is that I start to read and then it, it sends me to sleep almost instantly. But yes. then I kind of find that I go back to uh, to the book and I'm thinking, well, I'm sure I've read that, but I can't remember any of it because I've fallen asleep. So, yeah, I, I gave up on reading before going to bed. Um, um, yeah, I read business books and they send me to sleep. Oh, right. <laughs> or books about insomnia used to send me to sleep. <laughs> right. Um, we, we, we've got another question here before we go back into the, uh, uh, to the presentation where I think we were, we were about to talk around uh, relaxing, but uh, um, we've got a question here. I wake, in the office, uh, I wake in the early hours and can't get back to sleep. I listen to the radio for two to three hours and then can get back to sleep, but only lightly. Uh, this means I sleep later in the morning, which is a problem sometimes. Any suggestions? Um, okay, well, um, actually, it's, 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 it is my suggestion that we, Gavin and I were talking about um, earlier, that um, because I, I, I'm just trying to reduce the effects of, of jet lag, is um, maybe try eating a bit of banana. If you mm. wake up, you can't go back to sleep again. Um, so uh, I flew in, I got, got into Gatwick at half seven in the morning on, on Saturday, and slept a bit during the day, ended up going to bed quite late Saturday night or Sunday morning and then slept a lot yesterday. So last night was my first like proper night's sleep and I'm very conscious that I teach people sleep and I screwed up my kind of reducing jet lag thing over the weekend with the amount of sleep I was having and when I was having it. Anyway, uh, both my partner and I woke up at three o'clock this morning and I said, right, and I bought some bananas knowing that bananas will send you to sleep. And he went, he said, I'm not sure that's going to work. So anyway, I got bananas, chopped up into four bits. We both had a couple of bits each. And uh, he was asleep within 10 minutes. And I, I think I was about 20 minutes going to sleep. So bananas can contain something called tritophan. So any food that contains tritophan is, a, is an amino acid which helps produce serotonin, which will help go on to uh, produce melatonin. Uh, things like hummus, uh, oat cakes, um, hot milk, would, or milk will do it. Um, so um, maybe doing that will just help you go to sleep. Another thing is that humans aren't designed to sleep in one chunk of time to be what they call a monophasic sleeper. Uh, so we were polyphasic sleepers before the Industrial Revolution. So we used to sleep for a few hours, go to bed about sunset, depending on whether we were lark or an hour. Then we wake up at midnight for about 90 minutes, which would have been um, what would have been a sleep cycle. And this is where we used to go and visit the neighbors, have something to eat, pray, meditate, uh, have sex, go and feed, uh, do some feeding, <laughs> commit <laughs> crimes. So a lot happened in that 90 minutes. And, and then go back to sleep again. And then wake up with the sunrise, or if you're an owl, slightly later. So for some people, um, having a, like a, a whole night's sleep in one chunk is actually quite difficult because we're not designed to do that. Fantastic. Okay. So actually with the radio, you know, that could be um, a thing or listening to some soothing music. But I know quite a few people who listen to the radio um, that, you know, it helps them go, go to sleep. Fantastic. Well, the, I, I, I like the idea of the, uh, um, the banana tactic and... Yes. Um, I'll certainly be trying that if I'm uh, if I'm wide awake in the night. So let's jump back to the uh, to the to the PowerPoint then. So uh, we were talking about obviously avoiding a blue light, alcohol. Yeah. Another thing we got on to uh, uh, relaxing, which sounds uh, quite obvious, but um, uh, where are we with regards to uh, to relaxing and sleeping, and obviously getting prepared for sleep? Mm. So so really, your your body knows how to sleep, but because we have these very very bod um, busy modern lives nowadays, that we kind of think okay, right, it's time for bed, right, I need to go to sleep, and it, and it doesn't happen. So, you know, you need to allow your body to just sort of slow down a little bit. So whether or not um, it's having a bath or a shower before bedtime, um, you know, whether it's a bit of stretching, um, but, you know, telly off, uh, do some reading, listen to some music, whatever is going to sort of help you relax and get into that great night's sleep. I always use a little bit of lavender oil on my pillows and I use that when I'm traveling as well so that it's a sensory cue for my brain to understand that it's time for sleep, that it's recognizing it by smell. Um, what else uh, do I recommend? Um, 
was just going to say something and I've forgotten. Um, so about, yeah, something like taking a bath before bed with Epsom yeah. salts. Yeah, so baths and showers, uh, say reading. Yeah, just have like a little bit of a routine that say at a certain time. So for example, I know when the 10 o'clock news comes on, that is my cue to start getting ready for bed. I don't yeah. want to see the news because I find it too depressing. <laughs> and um, I don't really want to learn about Brexit before I go to sleep um, or see what Donald Trump's been up to. So that's my cue really to go and sort of like tidy up the kitchen and start getting ready for bed. And that's kind of like, my my little routine uh, so it doesn't have to be long uh, but it's just kind of a bit of a wind down also if you tend to wake up in the night feeling stressed about all the things you need to do this is a time to do your to-do list or have it done a lot earlier about the things that you need to do the next day or if there are things that are worrying you write down your worries so get it out of your head yeah. and get it onto paper uh, because if you're waking up in the night sort of um, mulling over things it's a very lonely time um, so you know the more that you can do at the sort of front end before you go to sleep the better I think that's a really good one and certainly I know myself if I've been working on a big project and you know I wake up in the middle of the night and then I'm just thinking I need to do this I need to do that I need to call him I need to email them mm. I'm, you know my, my brain is just absolutely buzzing with stuff that I've got to do and then by writing it down um, is, is a great way of me to kind of uh, you know almost download it from my brain and then I can go back to sleep. Absolutely, yes, yeah. And uh, have a notepad by your bed. Also, you can get pens which have got little LED lights by the nib so that you can write in the dark so you're going to not wake up anybody else if you have to scrawl notes in the night because there's nothing else than scrawling notes in the dark and not being able to read your notes in the morning. Um, so <laughs> you can get these pens off Amazon. Um, but yeah, so it's all about, all about that. So it's having those rituals having more or less the same time going to bed and, and just relaxing before you go to bed. Fantastic, excellent. Um, shall I move to the, uh, I think um, that might be, yeah, that's the, uh, we, we, we've got Andrea's uh, slides uh, after that and obviously Andrea's not on the line. If anyone else has got any more questions, feel free to, uh, to put them uh, over to us. Um, Rachel, are you going to talk a bit more about um, sleep and travel? I mean, yes. I just before the uh, webinar started, I remember we were talking about obviously jet lag and mm. um, how much uh, that can play a toll on the body. And what, 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 what's your experience and tips with regards to kind of handling jet lag and, 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 and getting back uh, to a regular sleep pattern? Okay, so, so really um, for long haul travel, if you're flying west, they say west is best, east is a beast. <laughs> and um, when you're flying west, you're gaining time. So it's going to be a lot quicker to get over jet lag. Uh, so, uh, for example, um, when was it? It was about 10, 10, 11 days ago, I flew out to um, Orlando. I'd also just done a couple of trips to Europe. So I had like five days in between two trips. A bit of a stressful time. My dad was moving house. I didn't get much sleep. It was, it was just a culmination of all sorts of different things. Then I had to get ready to go on a transatlantic trip. So uh, I had a couple of nights where I hadn't slept very well. So anyway, then we get on the, on the plane. It's a day, day flight. By the time I get to Orlando, which is about, uh, I think we got there about sort of five-ish, I was kind of feeling as I was flagging a little bit. And uh, by the time I got to the hotel room, I was like, I just don't even know what I want anymore. You know, and my partner's going, are you hungry? It's like, I don't know. Well, I've got to get you some food else you'll be hungry in the night. It's like, yeah, get me bananas. <laughs> so bananas. Uh, just get me some salad or something. And I just about managed to have a shower. And all I wanted to do was just be horizontal and just lie down and, and just sleep. And I, and I slept very well. And um, I kind of recovered quite quickly. And it probably just took me until the next night to just get into um, my proper sleep pattern. And I was absolutely fine. Um, all the guys have been out partying um, at this tech conference I went to with my partner. Um, they took a, a longer time to adjust. And then, uh, so coming back, um, I um, kind of, I probably had a gin and tonic on the plane. I, I, I would say don't drink, but it was my birthday on Friday. So I thought, I can't Happy birthday. Um, <laughs> but then um, I didn't drink any wine with my meal. The, the food was actually shocking. Uh, so I made sure that I ate in the terminal and actually had a decent meal. But one thing I do recommend for people is to actually take 
uh, your own food on the plane. So go to an eatery within an airport and then buy something fairly healthy so that you're in control of your food instead of being at the mercy of the airline. And you can eat when you want to eat rather than when they want you to eat. Also, another top tip, as soon as you get on the plane, is set your watch to the destination time so that um, you then know what time it is uh, so that uh, and, and then live in that time zone. Um, and then if you're doing a, an overnighter, um, have the decent earplugs with you. Have your own eye mask as well, because airlines supply um, eye masks which are made of polyester. So if it gets hot, then, you know, it, it gets a bit uncomfortable, it gets a bit sweaty. Um, so I've got an eye mask that I bought, which is pure silk. Um, I probably look complete idiot in it, but you know what? Um, at least it blocks out the, the light. It's blocked out the noise. And then um, I have my own neck cushion. And then I also take a note, my own like little inflatable cushion for my lumbar spine because I'm quite small and I find that aircraft seats are um, not that comfortable, even in premium economy. And then you just try and get the best amount of sleep you can. Also make sure you're well hydrated on the flight. Um, so I've got a water bottle that I fill up in the terminal. Uh, so I take it empty through security. Um, water is prohibitively, prohibitively expensive in airports. So filling up with free water is great. So I just make sure that I'm just keeping myself well hydrated and, um, and, and just kind of just looking after my well-being. Um, and then, I think that's a really important one. Uh, earlier in the year, we did a session on the importance of uh, um, hydration. And um, yes. I can't remember exactly what the stat was, but I do remember uh, there was a stat that related to how rapidly the body does um, dehydrate when yes. you uh, jump on a plane. And it was it was litres and litres. And, um, you know, you, I think when that stat was uh, uh, revealed, now every time I, 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 I've always got water with me, and uh, coming back from a flight from Barcelona a couple of weeks ago, I didn't. And you just seem to notice it now. More. Yes, you do. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah right. absolutely. And, and the other thing is you, you look at what cabin pressure does to your body. So, um, you know, when they hand out um, sort of free bottles of water or even if with your own water bottle, as soon as the cabin's pressurised and you undo it, you know, it releases air. It goes, Shh. You know that's what's happening to your body so you obviously feel a bit bloated um mm. when you're flying uh, and you know you just feel a bit out of sorts so by the time i got to orlando i had a banging headache i had a stomach ache and i just felt really out of sorts coming back um i didn't i felt fine um which is which is strange so it's, it's like what was it about that trip was it because I just was slightly out of sorts before I got on that flight with a slight lack of sleep for a few days. Um, but um, yeah, so it's really important that you look after yourself, you know, keep your skin moisturised, use lip salve, um, hand cream, you know, anything that you can do just to put moisture back in your, in your body. And if you can take your own food on board, then do, because uh, mm -hmm. the food that I had was absolutely atrocious. But... Um, uh, yeah, so, uh, and then when you get back, so it's, as I said, flying east is a beast. So for every time zone that you, you cross, obviously um, it, it's an hour's difference. It, it's going to have an effect on your body. So I am five hours out at the moment, or it's probably improving. So what they say is it's a day for every hour of time zone that you cross for your body to recover. So, um, so you put, so I know probably by Thursday I'll be back to feeling normal, but I'm feeling absolutely fine at the moment because, uh, you know, when I did wake up in the night, I had my bananas, went back to school again. I also have got these glasses that um, put, uh, they're called um, Luminette glasses. Um, I got them actually free a few years ago because they were trial. This company was trialing them, but they're. About 180 quid. So if you do travel long haul a lot, they may be worth the investment. And um, they, they've got little LED lights in them and um, they shine bright light or blue light straight into the eyes and just have them on for 20 minutes. And you can move around the house and you know, unload the dishwasher or do whatever you want to do. Uh, otherwise, sit in front of an LED light panel for 20 minutes and it's all about your brain understanding when it's light and when it's dark. So I'm training my SCN now to go okay it's now daytime so stop producing melatonin you may feel as though it's nighttime but it's not 
Uh, so what I'm going to do today, it's quite sunny outside every um, hour for five minutes. I'm going to go outside in the sunlight um, just to make sure that I'm getting enough light in my eyes. Uh, another thing that I use is a little drop of lavender oil to help me sleep on a plane as well. That's another thing. Fantastic. So, um, yeah, just going back to, so really what should have happened with my sleep is that when I got back to Gatwick at half seven, I got home at half nine. Um, as soon as I started to flag to feel tired, then only sleep for about 90 minutes. So that's a sleep cycle. Because then I don't want to screw up my sleep for um, a night, my normal bedtime. So I want to try and keep awake until, you know, at least eight or nine o'clock um, in the evening. And then my sleep cycle should sort of start to get back to normal. Um, but it can be a problem for people that, you know, it could be three or four weeks before they get back to normal. But I found that if I'm doing the light thing, it generally sort of kicks back in and it's not too bad. But I, it, about ooh, 20 years ago, it took me three weeks to get over a, a flight to, to the west coast of the States. Uh, hotel rooms is another thing. Um, make sure that you've got a decent pillow. Uh, it doesn't really matter what level of hotel that you've, you, you're staying in. They do have an assortment of pillows. So if you don't like the squidgy feather pillows, then quite often they'll have a, a, a foam one or an anti-allergy one which might be a little bit um, firmer. Always take lavender oil with you because it's that sensory cue for the brain. It's a, your brain recognises it's time for sleep. Also it's kind of a safety thing because if you're sleeping in a new environment there's a part of your brain, the amygdala, which is re uh, responsible for the stress response, the fight or flight response, and it's scanning for danger the whole time. So you're sleeping in a new environment even though you know it's safe um, that's why sometimes you don't always sleep well in a hotel room. Um, set the air con or the temperature, the thermostat between 16 to 18 degrees or as low as you can to that um, amount. I found in hotels recently you can't get below about 19 degrees, that's fine. Uh, wear your eye mask if the curtains don't work properly, but a lot of the major chain hotels will have blackout blinds. Um, and then turn off all the standby lights. So you were talking about your wife and the... Um, you know the um, red stamp. Covering up everything, yeah. Covering up everything with pieces of tape. Yeah, yeah. So some people actually do take back tape with them to block it out, but obviously you can't do fire alarms on the ceiling. But that's where getting used to sleeping with an eye mask is great. So I tend not to sleep with one in the summer, but I will do. Uh, sorry, in the winter, but I will do in the summer. Um, so I'm kind of used to sleeping with a with an eye mask just to block out um, any light. And of course, earplugs are an absolute must because you don't yes. know who is in the room next to you, what they're doing. Um, when one of the hotels we stayed in last week, uh, there was a couple arguing because he was snoring and they're having this massive row. <laughs> so, yeah, the earplugs so, came in handy for that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so those earplugs are an absolute must. Yeah, and uh, yeah, so um, those are kind of my top tips really. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, um, I'm conscious of time. We, uh, yes. I know uh, we started late, so um, we, we, we've kind of uh, gone on for, uh, for an hour here. Um, if anyone has got any uh, final questions, do send them over. But um, this session has been really, really uh, interesting. There's so many uh, top tips that you've, uh, you've given us here, Rachel. You know, everything ranging from, you know, reducing the blue light exposure in the evening, don't consume in caffeine too late. Obviously, the bananas is a, uh, is, a, is, a, is, a, is, a is a big one and the new one for us. Um, sleeping, you know, uh, and waking at consistent times. I've taken down so many notes. Taking a melatonin supplement, if you can do, uh, if you can get hold of that. I'm, I'm keen to investigate that. Uh, yeah, I, I probably say don't, uh, yeah. unless it's prescribed. Uh, people do it for yeah. jet lag, but because um, it's a hormone. Um, I mean, everybody eats the moan, but... Um, if you're not producing enough melatonin then or you feel that you're not getting enough sleep then you need to go to your doctor or see yeah. a sleep specialist but probably the odd one for jet lag is probably okay but yeah. your body should reset itself fairly quickly okay and then obviously the power of uh, of lavender and we yes. spoke about um alcohol and obviously um you know not drinking well we're all going to, well, the majority of us may well have a, uh, a few, a uh, couple of drinks at night, but obviously it can have a, uh, a negative impact. So um, that's one to, uh, to be mindful of. Um, and obviously optimising your bedroom environment. So with the yes. blackout blinds, we spoke about the tape, the bed, um, the full environment there plays a, uh, 
um, a massive factor in 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 uh, getting a good night's sleep. And if you haven't changed your mattress for uh, for, for more than uh, eight years, then it might be uh, worthwhile um, looking at um, looking at changing that. And I can highly recommend John Lewis uh, mattresses. Um, yeah, I use um, uh, a Lisa one, so L E E S A. So this is one of the ones that you can use for a hundred nights. But yeah, so it's what you know you find more comfortable and if you're sleeping with someone else does it move if they move yeah or do you all like sink in the middle which isn't good <laughs> <laughs> and obviously um taking a relaxing bath or shower before bed um and a comfortable pillow comfortable pillow is uh, is yeah. obviously important so there's there's so many takeaways that we've got here um I just want to say a massive thank you to you, Rachel. I'll uh, I'll skip through to the uh, to the end of the uh, the slide deck. Uh, there were some uh, bits and pieces from uh, from Andrew here that I'll quickly uh, scamper through. Um, they they a lot of this we've uh, we've already covered. It was a shame we couldn't get uh, Andrew online due to um, some of the uh, technical challenges we had um, at the beginning. But the uh, this webinar will be uh, recorded. It will be put online onto the uh, chambers. Um, website in the uh, in the health and well-being section and um today's webinar is our penultimate one of the year so we're, in, uh, we're going to be moving through um into december uh, very soon so on monday 3rd of december at 10 a.m uh, we've got our last webinar of the year which is focused on financial well-being so obviously christmas is uh, fast approaching um often it's a, a difficult time for for some of us with regards to um, you know financial outlay but um, Kate Talbot who's a uh, um, an IFA will be talking around uh, financial well-being and uh, and getting financial peace of mind so um, quite timely for that session um, if you're a chamber member just a bit of a plug here there's a couple of uh, health and well-being services that we have if you're interested in that one is with AXA PPP healthcare the other one is a uh, primary healthcare plan with, uh, with Westfield Health, so I'll take the sheepskin coat off now. And lastly, here's the contact details for Andrea, uh, Rachel and, uh, and Ria. Um, I just wanna say a massive thank you to, uh, to you, Rachel, because uh, um, your, your knowledge on this, uh, this topic is obviously immense. And um, I've really enjoyed today's session and I've, heard, I've learned a hell of a lot, as I'm yeah. sure. <laughs> So I'm sure a lot of our uh, uh, listeners here today had. So have you got any final words that you want to share with us, Rachel? Um, oh, gosh, final words. Yeah, well, just make sure you prioritise your sleep. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, and, uh, you know, if your organisations need help um, with um, ed educating your employees on sleep, then I, I love doing talks and workshops. So that's kind of the main thing that I do, as well as employee wellbeing. Fantastic. Excellent. Well, thank you all for listening. Uh, massive thank you, uh, Rachel. And uh, hopefully we'll have you tuning in to our next session in December. Thanks, everyone.